Okay, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, ICTS Infosys uh, Chandrasekhar Lectures by uh, Professor Joe Silk. Uh, so before the lecture itself, let me just say a few words about the lecture series and, uh, and then we'll have a formal introduction to the speaker and the lecture, uh, but please bear with me. Uh, uh, so the ICTS Infosys Chandrasekhar lecture series has been started uh, uh, from the inception. Uh, it is uh, one of our flagship lecture series, uh, which uh, recognizes uh, some of the preeminent scientists in the physical sciences and invites them to give us a set of lectures. Typically, the first one is at a broader colloquium level uh, talk and uh, followed by others, which may be more technical. Uh, and I'm very happy that Professor Silk has accepted our invitation to uh, deliver the uh, Chandrasekhar lectures in this uh, part of this program. And I would like to thank also all the program organizers, uh, many of them, so I won't uh, name them all, uh, but many of them are here already. And I would like to thank them for putting together this very uh, nice innovative program. I think many of you are students who are here for the school part of the meeting and I was hearing about the innovative uh, um, structure of the school. Uh, and I hope you will all have a very productive time. Uh, I'll say a little bit about ICTS. Uh, you probably all familiar now by now with the campus. Many of you are staying here and our lecture is in that auditorium, the Ramanujan Auditorium. Uh, uh, this is the lecture hall. You have your uh, lunches here, tea breaks here. This is the academic area where the faculty, students, postdocs of ICTS uh, sit. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the picture, even if it's a little dated picture, but an aerial view of ICTS. But as an institution, ICTS is, uh, that's what I want to tell you a little more about. It's one of the newest centers of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, and like all the centers, uh, one of our core, um, uh, the core mandate is, of course, research. And we have a very active research group, uh, research groups in many areas. Uh, and I'll say a bit about that. But the uniqueness of ICTS and the unique part of our mandate is to uh, run programs uh, very much along the lines of what uh, other institutions like the KITP in Santa Barbara, uh, the GGI and IAS Princeton and others run, uh, just to name a few in the physical sciences. Uh, so the, uh, our uh, in-house research is therefore combined with these visitor-driven programs. And unlike some of these other institutions, ours spans a broad range in the theoretical sciences, in physics, mathematics, and now computer science, quantitative biology, climate sciences. So uh, several areas sort of in, a, in the broad uh, top, in the broad sort of coming under theoretical sciences umbrella. This is by the way, a picture watercolor of our library building. If you haven't been there, uh, it's a nice place to go and hide and work, especially since all of you are forming little working groups. If you want to work there in uh, quiet and peace, uh, uh, this is uh, painted. In, so this building inspired one of our visitors. And if uh, ICTS campus inspires you to do something similar, uh, please share with us your artwork. Uh, we'd be very happy to highlight it. Uh, so uh, this uh, pictures of our faculty, uh, we have, um, uh, uh, we have several uh, uh, researchers in a number of areas. We don't have departments, uh, so we just have fairly fluid groupings. We have about 30 faculty over um, 75 PhD students for our active PhD program under the TIFR umbrella. We take in students through both the TIFR exam as well as through GEST, uh, the joint entrance exam. We have an active postdoctoral program uh, with over 30 people uh, in these areas. So the areas at the moment in the mathematical sciences include dynamical systems, PDE, climate sciences, geometry and mathematical physics, probability. And as I said, very recently, we have uh, got our first uh, computer scientist. Uh, um, uh, the, in the more physical sciences, we have Astrophysics, of course, uh, uh, related to uh, so, uh, with people doing things in some ways related to 
uh, uh, some of the th uh, topics in the school. Um, uh, in complex systems is a very broad topic, uh, which includes statistical mechanics, fluid dynamics, condensed matter physics, and quantitative biology. And finally, string theory, quantum field theory, quantum gravity. Uh, so uh, our programs are, uh, uh, have been in a number of different uh, areas, as I said, and they are organized by the global scientific community. And it's based on an open program uh, proposal, uh, which has a twice a year call. So it's very easy to remember the end of the year and the middle of the year. Uh, and uh, so uh, these calls close uh, these deadlines, but you can submit the proposal at any time uh, for a meeting typically about two to three weeks long, like this one. Uh, we encourage um, a pedagogical component like you have here, uh, especially because we would like to build the expertise among younger researchers in the country in many of these areas. We have over 30, 35 now, actually, this figure needs to be changed, uh, uh, programs a year with over 2,000 external participants with a large international involvement. So it's uh, uh, become a science hub for the country's researchers. And the idea is to foster new collaborations and for people to brainstorm, come up with new ideas. And I hope the ICTS environment will facilitate that and all of you will take advantage of that. And uh, of course, if with good ideas result in uh, publications, we would like to encourage you to let our program team know, uh, because that will, of course, help us to make the case for ICTS's funding in the future. Uh, we've had over 600 research publications uh, acknowledge ICTS uh, for uh, the genesis or the uh, uh, for the sort of uh, development of the ideas that led to those publications in the last five years uh, since we've kept track. So this is at least a lower bound on the number of uh, publications that have come out of these programs. And uh, we hope that this will continue and increase. All the talks uh, uh, that uh, happen in these meetings are archived on our YouTube channel. And there are now, as a very vast repository of uh, very valuable talks from popular science to a very technical. And so whatever be the subject that you might be interested in, it's very likely that there'll be an ICTS uh, talk on uh, either the pedagogical level at a graduate student level or uh, even further. So please explore this channel. And I think you will, especially for the young people, I think you'll find a lot of valuable uh, material there. Uh, we have, of course, these special lectures, and in this program, we are having uh, the Infosys Chandrasekhar lectures, as I mentioned, by Professor Silk, and next week uh, by Professor Kaiser, the ICTS Distinguished Lecture. We have, in, uh, we have also lectures in the mathematical sciences after Ramanujan, in computer science, biology, and in engineering sciences after Turing. Vishweshwara in uh, a popular public lecture talks in uh, astrophysics, cosmology, uh, and a number of others, Abdus Salam, Kosambi, Einstein, you can explore on our webpage uh, these uh, uh, lectures. Finally, let me say a few words about the third component of our uh, mandate, which we also take very seriously, and that's outreach. And uh, we have very active science communication aspect to our outreach through the Copy with Curiosity, uh, something called Vigyan Adda, which started during the pandemic, uh, which is aimed more at undergraduates and uh, which has been uh, very successful, uh, and, and public lectures of various kinds. Uh, uh, we, in terms of science interaction, uh, so going a little beyond science communication, uh, there was a very uh, innovative uh, exhibition put together by people from ICTS called Cosmic Zoom. So it's exploring the cosmos at various length scales. Uh, and you can sort of uh, click your way through uh, from uh, starting from the uh, planetary scales and uh, or human scales to, uh, uh, to all the way to the very big and the very small and sort of close the circle in some ways there. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's a nice uh, uh, exhibit that's uh, there on our webpage. Uh, we are also a part of the uh, 
efforts to have a Bangalore Science Festival or BASH, uh, which uh, will hopefully happen in the coming uh, year or so. Um, and finally, uh, we have a lot of efforts in science pedagogy where uh, you see some science demos in some of the neighboring schools. Uh, we've worked with the planetarium for training some of the teachers, uh, government school teachers of Karnataka. Uh, and recently we started a math circle network to identify and nurture mathematical talent from and this is a pan TIFR actually effort uh, well, led by people from TIFR, but actually involving now uh, institutions from all over the country, uh, including the ICERs and others. And this uh, works with children from grades six to 10 and um, is held online, but we are starting in-person math circles. We've started one with Raman Research Institute here. Uh, in Bangalore, one with uh, one in Kolkata, and soon others in uh, Chennai, perhaps, and Pune, et cetera. So that's to give you a little glimpse of ICTS. Uh, thanks for your indulgence. And uh, I'll now invite uh, Professor Shada Balam from TIFR Mumbai to introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rajesh, for that wonderful introduction to ICTS and all the activities. All the activities it's being done here. It's, it's very impressive to see the full list. So uh, it is my great honor and uh, privilege, uh, an absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Joseph I Ibersil, or Professor Joe Silk, as the world knows him. Professor Silk is associated with the Institute of Physics, uh, Institute of Astrophysics Paris and also homeward professor of physics and astronomy at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he's also professor of astronomy at Gresham College. Formerly, he was civilian chair uh, of astronomy at University of Oxford and chair of astronomy at Oxford, as well as chair of astronomy at Berkeley. Professor Silk did his mathematical tripos at University of Cambridge. Then he did his PhD from Harvard in 1968. During his very distinguished career, Professor Silk has pioneered many areas in cosmology and astrophysics, especially on the physics of CMB, the formation of galaxies, the baryonic process affecting structure formation, and the dark matter from different perspectives. The fundamental process of silk damping in CMB anisotropies bears his name. Perhaps the greatest contribution of Professor Silk to cosmology community is his mentorship of students and postdoc, many of whom are biggest names in the cosmology and astrophysics community now. Many of us know, many of us who knows him closely are amazed by his energy and enthusiasm, even at this age, which will put the youngsters to shame. He is a member of American Physical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Royal Society, uh, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. His awards and honors are many, uh, but to list a few, I will mention only three. For his lifetime contribution to cosmology, he was awarded the Gold Medal of Royal Society in 2008. This was followed by winning almost a million dollar for 2011 Balzan Prize and very recently Gruber Prize in cosmology in 2009. I would like to welcome Professor Ashok Sen to uh, present a memento to Professor Self before we get started. Professor Joe Silk is going to tell us today uh, the, about the future of cosmology. Joe, stage is yours. So, um, thank you, um, Shadam. Thank you, Director, for your kind words. Um, it's a pleasure to be here visiting this wonderful institute. Um, uh, I'm sure it'll be destined to be uh, the equal of uh, those other that were mentioned, including at Santa Barbara, in, and it probably is already, and it's just a, a great environment for doing research and for inspiration, I, I found just wandering around the, uh, the campus. Okay, so my goal here today is to describe the future in the field of cosmology, that is our, uh, our studies of the universe, and make, give you the message that uh, our use of terrestrial telescopes and even space telescopes currently is uh, 
I wouldn't say reaching its limits, but it's reaching a stage of frustration. And um, I, I, I really think that I've tried to make the case for you that our next major step forward in this science and no doubt in other aspects of astronomy too, will be to go to the moon and build structures there for science. So um, let me begin um, by briefly reviewing for you uh, how modern cosmology began. Uh, really um, was one man, Georges Lemaitre, who uh, managed somehow to combine a life um, as an, on, on, on a day, an ordained priest along with that of a scientist. And he, he often said there were, there were two ways and he chose, um, he chose them both. Uh, and what he did remarkably um, at the time that the, uh, uh, the model of the Big Bang was proposed by him and by Alexander Friedman simultaneously, um, a consequence of Einstein's um, theory of general relativity, uh, you can see here that uh, the Metra proposed in his models, this is from his um, a sketchbook, that the universe, the size of the universe, there were different models. It could either reach a maximum size and collapse, or it could keep on going and even accelerate. And we know now um, that these two phenomena of acceleration and of eventual deceleration, uh, one or the other, depend on substances that we know are there, we infer they're there from the data called dark energy and dark matter, but we are still, after so many years, almost a century, we still don't know what they are. I'll come back to that. But what is remarkable is that as early as 1933, soon after the, um, uh, the universe expansion was discovered empirically by, by Hubble, um, Lemaitre wrote this down in one of his papers, that um, the energy of the vacuum uh, could not be zero because of quantum fluctuations. This was the beginning of quantum theory. He was aware of that. And he postulated there was a pressure associated with the fluctuations of the vacuum. And this had the effect of um, what Einstein had called the cosmological constant, which was the vacuum, and gave you, in fact, an acceleration uh, to space. Anyway, that's enough for the history. So let's jump forward to the modern era. And so we have this after nearly a century of study, uh, we now have this wonderful picture falling into place of cosmology with precision too. So what I'm gonna tell you about, we, we measure things like the rate of expansion of the universe um, and uh, its detailed structure with an accuracy that when I was young was unbelievable. When I, when I was a student, we, we, we talked about 50% uncertainties in the rate of expansion of the universe. Now we're down to 5% or less. It's an order of magnitude improvement. And we're not at the end of that yet either, as I will try to emphasize to you. Anyway, so looking at this, um, at this picture, and here we have on the right, the universe today, um, and galaxies formed as we look back into the past. We could view this happening with our big telescopes. Um, before the, the galaxies, before the stars, there was a region that we call the Dark Ages. And this is, in some sense, the new frontier for us, because our big telescopes were exploring where the galaxies were, were um, in the past, we're exploring how they were born, we see them um, very brilliant when they were young, but we haven't got beyond that to the Dark Ages. I'll explain to you how we can do that. That clearly is necessary if we're to examine how galaxies formed, understand our origins better. And then at some point, one runs into this fog in the universe, uh, which is essentially the primordial radiation from the Big Bang, um, which early on was um, hot enough to ionize all the electrons and give you sort of a scatter completely and allow you to see back no further directly. Okay, and so that basically was about 400,000 years after the beginning. Before then, it's mostly a matter of speculation, but the great advance in cosmology theory since Lemaitre's day was the theory of inflation. So the early universe began from nothing or almost nothing and went through a transition due to the properties of the quantum fluctuations, the vacuum, to give you this acceleration. Uh, there was a phase very early on, as there is a much weaker phase right now, and that theory we call inflation. However, we're, we've run into a problem 
while we can piece together this wonderful picture based on observations back to almost the first stars for that uh, based on theory apart from the this, this surface in the universe uh, back in, in time 400,000 years ago where we see the ripples in the right code background, the fluctuations in temperature to the seeds of structure. So that, that's all wonderful that it fits together, it fits in with our, with our theory, but we're a long way from actually proving that theory. And here is the problem that this dark energy, which gives you the acceleration that Lemaitre essentially invented with, with what he called the cosmological constant, um, and we now interpret as, as, um, as, as uh, the energy of the vacuum, so-called dark energy, the dark matter which dominates the universe. Um, we're very comfortable with this idea because we measure from the motions of the stars and the galaxies, this dark matter content that we can't see directly. We've been trying to identify it. Most likely it's some sort of weakly interacting particle. But we're looking for that. We haven't found anything yet. Um, so it's a question. As I said, the new frontier in astronomy to try to get more information about our past is to go into the dark ages. And that is a new adventure that's just beginning as I'm gonna tell you about in this lecture. And that will take us back to our origins. That, that we hope strong. Okay. Um, so let me just say a few words about the fear of inflation. It was um, in the, uh, a, a wonderful conjecture um, uh, some now, some 40 years ago, uh, these are the pioneers behind it. And, and they laid down essentially the theory that can account for why the universe today is as large as it is, why it's relatively the same in all directions, and where even the fluctuations that see the galaxies come from quantum fluctuations at the beginning and have since greatly expanded with the expansion. So that, that, those are the great theoretical successes of this inflation theory. We'd love to believe it is correct, but essentially we need to verify it. Its major ingredients are so far unidentified in terms of the physics of those ingredients, dark matter, dark energy. We need to, so how on earth can we verify this theory of our beginnings? Well, there is a way, um, if you get enough data, you really can try to understand very basic predictions of the inflation theories I try to explain to you as we go along here. But first of all, let me review all our attempts at the moment to get to grips with our beginnings with the dark energy. How, how do you measure this? Well, what we do are develop surveys of many galaxies, thousands, hundreds of thousands, now millions, now billions of galaxies actually, with their distances from the redshift. And you try to get precise value of the constants of cosmology, you try to see if the constant that Einstein invented and Lambda identified with acceleration, if that really is a constant, if there were deviations, that would be clues as to its physics. We haven't found those yet. And every better experiment we do, improved experiment, seems to always converge on what is more or less the same place, the original number, a uh, single number that I, Lemaitre predicted and this pressure equals zero, phenomenon, which is the equation of state of the modern universe. So, so there we are, it, it's, un, it's frustrating. We're just converging the original hypothesis of the accelerating universe, but we have not got to an understanding by looking for some flaws or something, or some details that deviate from the notion of a simple concept that tells us what it might be. Okay, so that's the story. Now there's another wonderful prediction that inflation does because it went through this rapid expansion and um, uh, gravity was changing in strength rapidly for a very brief time, it produced a sea of gravitational waves from the beginning. And these are greatly stretched out by the expansion. They're very low frequency today, but they do leave a signature in the fluctuations in the radiation, the microwave background. There should be a residual shear or twist, not, not a compression or, or expansion mode, basically a shearing, which is the effect of a gravity wave passing by you. Okay, it doesn't compress you, but it, it can shear anything in its way. That's how we detect them, actually, with the wonderful experiments, which I mentioned at the end of my talk. Anyway, there should be this residual background from the beginning, which leaves its imprint on the microwave background fluctuations. These are tiny polarization. We haven't seen that yet. Uh, we're developing bigger experiments to look for it. But I would say, it, to summarize where we are today, wonderful experiments, uh, they're all sort of um, trying to set limits on this shear of the gravity waves, um, but 
there is no definitive prediction of what one should be looking for. That's the problem. We're doing beautiful experiments. We're getting more and more precise numbers, but they're always upper limits. So it's great. We'll have to do that, but there's no guarantee of success. We want to have some guaranteed theory that tells us uh, what the beginning was like, some, some, some experiment that could do that for us. But dark matter, we've been looking hard for this weakly interacting particle. We basically do experiments deep underground um, where we can be protected from the cosmic rays and look for rare events in the dark that might be indications of particle scattering. We haven't found them yet, uh, despite many experiments. And the, the problem really is with this is that in this um, plot here, which is of the particle cross-section versus the mass, there's a huge amount of parameter space uh, that we have no way of ever surveying. What we do is, you know, it's as though you've lost something and you go out at night to look for it and you look under the lamppost because that's where, that's where the light is. It's a bit like that in particle physics right now. We're looking in favored areas, doing beautiful experiments, but there's no guarantee of success. Um, if we're lucky, we'll find something, we'll find that elusive particle. And so it continues. Um, it gets even worse. Look, we're building a huge collider. I, I hope we'll build one to replace the Large Hadron Collider. Um, from the 27 kilometer radius of the 27 of, of the Hadron Collider will go up to this super collider 10 times larger um, in, in 10 times more energy, something like more than 50 kilometers across. Um, and you can see it's planned for the future. It's designed to look for particles uh, that are produced from collisions or energy particles that might be the relic particles of the dark matter. Okay. So far, we've found nothing that's uh, even really hint as to what it might be. We can only do better by trying harder. Um, and then the final thing that um, I want to just bring to your attention is that also, you know, if, if your experiments to, um, uh, to find these missing ingredients don't work, you could maybe say, well, maybe gravity is wrong. Maybe there is no dark matter. Maybe we've got Einstein's theory of gravity wrong. Um, that's possible. Uh, but again, here is the problem. First of all, Einstein's theory of gravity has passed all tests so far to beautiful precision. But you know, it is an approximation. There could be something mysterious out there in the re regime of strong gravity. But if you then think about the parameter space you have to search, it becomes a bit depressing because here is the scale at which you might want to test gravity, a length scale and a mass scale. And so far, we've tested it very well, where we have the universe, the galaxy, and our sun. All this other space, you know, there could be deviations. We, we haven't been able to test it inside a black hole. Who knows what's going on there? And so forth. So, in other words, gravity itself, given the possible parameter space, it's very, very hard to test. Okay, so if it were, you know, something other than Einstein. So what we're looking for is an experiment that would give us something serious, something definite, something definitive, okay? And exp experimental techniques that have a guaranteed result to shed light on our origins, okay? And so what, what do we do about that? Okay, so to summarize, one feature in common with all of the experiments, from large scale structure to dark matter searches, to even testing gravity or colliding particles together, there's no guaranteed return. They're wonderful experiments. We're going to do them, but we don't know what the, if we're lucky, we'll get some amazing outcome. Um, maybe that's happened in the past, but right now it's very, very hard to see our way forward to something really new that will be a major, solve a major problem in physics. Okay, so um, I want to try to argue now that there is a way to go to improve the situation. And that is to explore the dark ages, because in the dark ages, long before there was structure, there was something uh, that we can measure and it gives us far more information content than all the galaxies, the billions in the universe, okay? And the reason is that what we're looking for are the building blocks of the galaxies. There were no stars there in the dark ages, um, but the building blocks were clouds, hydrogen clouds. And to make a galaxy the size of the Milky Way, you need millions of hydrogen clouds. We can estimate roughly what the masses are of the building block from simple physics arguments. They're sort of a million solar masses or so a million times the mass of the sun. And so there are millions per galaxy, which means that if you have a clever experiment which can map the universe in hydrogen, you can suddenly pick up millions of time more information than you can from surveying a billion galaxies with your, with your latest telescope, okay, as, as we're doing anyway. So there's more information there. That, that's the thing that we have to try to grab onto, I would argue. 
And you, I've tried graphically to show you this information content. See, this is the scale at which you're probing um, uh, fluctuations in the early universe, um, going down to smaller and smaller scales. Ga the largest structures are over here on the left, galaxies roughly in the middle, and these clouds I'm talking about on the right. And, and so what we've done so far is we're exploring the microwave background, but that's limited. There's a, a few million pixels on the sky. That's all you have. You can never get more than that. So that, that limits your information content. Likewise, if you study galaxies, maybe you have a billion or, or a bit less because everyone is a bit different. You have to average over them somehow. Maybe you have a billion you know, modes of information. Maybe I would say 100 million conservatively. It's only when you go to these clouds that you want to look for where you have huge amounts of information, maybe trillions of modes of information or bits of information that you can then analyze once you do the measurements to, to get information about the beginning of the universe. So that's the idea. Um, if you want to make your ultimate test of inflation, we better work in the dark ages, which for us is a new frontier. But it's going to be incredibly hard. It turns out that the way you do this is what is called the 21 centimeter um, emission or absorption of hydrogen. That's the spin flip tra transition when the electron spin is parallel to the protons. If you undergo a flip, it's a slightly higher sta state when it's anti parallel to parallel. And that gives you. Um, a microscopic energy, 21 centimeter wavelength of, any, of, of radiation, radio frequency, which you can use to study hydrogen. And you, so the, our, the idea is you look at these clouds because gas cools down more than radiation does since the Big Bang. The, cows, the clouds are colder than the background radiation. You see them in shadow from the cosmic microwave background. The signal you're looking for uh, as you ex excite the spin flip transition that absorbs the light out, the radio waves out, is just 10 milli Kelvin. And the problem is the background light um, from all the foregrounds there are is thousands of Kelvin. So it's a very tiny effect you're looking for, but if, you, if you're clever enough to work your way down to the fluctuations, you suddenly can pick up all this information. So that's the idea. It's a real challenge for radio astronomers. I'm gonna show you now that we can do this, in principle, we can do this, but we have to go to one place to build our telescopes. We haven't been yet really, and that's the far side of the moon. So that's the message I want to give you, how this works. It's a great challenge really. It's wonderful actually for the younger generation because most people like me giving these talks now, you know, I won't be around when we do this, but in 20, 20 years, 30 years, we'll have telescopes on the far side, that's for sure. I'll try to justify that for you. And that's how we do this. And the reason we want to go to the far side of the moon is it's, is it's the quietest radio environment in the entire inner solar system. On the Earth, we have the ionosphere, okay? That's a disaster for low frequency radio waves. Why low frequency? Well, 21 centimeter is what we measure now. We map the galaxy in that, in that wavelength. But when you go back to the universe, it's redshifted. Then it was to, to maybe 10 meters. So we're doing 10 meter wavelength astronomy today. That's the idea. It doesn't take complex telescopes, just simple dipoles, 10 meters long, right? a few meters long, whatever. Um, so we know how to do it, but we have to do it on the far side of the moon where there is no ionosphere to give you this problem. And why the far side, there's no noise from the earth, a terrible source of pollution because of radio waves, among other things, marine radar, whatever, which makes it a, the sky a noisy place, but the far side is ideal. Okay, so that's, that's the way we, we, we intend to go. And just to summarize the, the information aspects, you have a million bits of information from the microwave background. It's a wonderful probe. It's got our seeds, structure formation of galaxies at least, but not, won't do more. May, we hope it might test inflation if we get this shearing signal from polarization, but that's by no means guaranteed. All the galaxies that we're doing in the big surveys now, again, it'll be more precise, but it's, there's no guarantee we'll get the answer. But if we want to, unravel this hydrogen signal from the very own the universe, then in the dark ages, then we have the possibility of getting precision enough to, to make a, a guaranteed test of the inflation theory. I'll show you in a moment that predicts a signal that can be measurable with this much information. And predicted hasn't been done yet, but that's the, that's the hope. Okay, so um, here's the far side um, where we want to put some of these telescopes. So, as I said, you want to probe at um, roughly 10 meters wavelength. That means uh, you're looking back to when the universe was a 50th of its present size, redshift 50. And you're going to do this at roughly 100 times the resolution we currently could do for the microwave background. 
whether that means um, you know fractions of an arc minute or something. You're probing equivalent scales of you know the size of these clouds, hundreds of thousands of parsecs. So if you want to estimate what your optimal array is just from simple sensitivity arguments, it turns out you need millions of dipoles, roughly each 10 meter each, the wavelength of the light that you're looking for, are spread over maybe uh, 50 or 100 kilometers. That's the equivalent of the size of, um, of one of these um, craters over here. Yeah, the whole thing is 4,000 kilometers. Okay, so basically you want a, a nice big smooth patch of the moon to use uh, for your radio experiment. So what sort of radio experiment are we talking about? Um, well, here is the, real, the problem that I mentioned already. Um, if you ask what is the foreground from all the hot electrons in the universe, which we know in the galaxies everywhere really in space between us and the dark ages, and that's the problem. You, you measure this, um, this warm foreground, which rises in frequency to low frequencies and is, you know, Eight thousand, tens of thousands, maybe a few thousand or even 10,000 Kelvin looking against this millikelvin signal, which you can predict. Um, okay, and, and you have to think of clever ways like using the frequency resolution uh, uh, in your beam, in your telescope, which is a way of, of chopping the signal up into um, along the line of sight because it's redshifted uh, versus the angular resolution which is another way of chopping your signal up. Okay, so you can, you know, you have various clever ways of looking for signals that have structure in Fourier space that's differently from all the foregrounds. So what you're doing is looking for a signal has a different spectral structure. It's a line after all, but highly smoothed out by the expansion, but it's a line, a spectral feature. And also it's a spatial feature in the sense that you can sort things out by looking perpendicular and parallel using frequency uh, and angular resolution to do. So these are clever tricks. That my radio astronomer colleagues uh, exploit. Um, and then um, uh, I'll show you now the experiments that we're going to do. Well, the first point is that we know this is simple technology by modern standards. We know how to build dipoles. In fact, right now we're constructing uh, a hundred thousand element dipole array in Western Australia to do astronomy from the earth at low frequencies evidently, but we have to do the same thing on the moon, roughly of that size. That's the idea. Um, so the technology is not a problem, but of course we have to get that signal and get it back to Earth. I'll explain how we how we how we'll be doing that. Okay. Um, so there is one already one radio telescope at the far side of the moon, a single dipole. Okay, put there by the Chinese at the beginning of 2019. Okay. Unfortunately, it doesn't work at all because you know it was a it was a great idea to get it there, but they, if, unfortunately, there was too much radio noise. They didn't have the right technology when they, when they built their, their instrument. But they, they, China will not give up. I'll show you in a second that they'll be going back um, and do something much better. In fact, this is what they're going to do. So there are two experiments planned for 2026, not far away. So one is this American experiment, which again is a single dipole. It'll go on the far side of the moon and it'll look for the dark age signal. With one dipole, you don't have any angular resolution. 45 degrees, you just can get the global signal, but that's the first step you want to do. You get the global signal, the typical diminution of the shadow, and then eventually you look for the fluctuation. So that's the way we'll be doing this in the future. With one dipole, you can only do the global signal. With hundreds of thousands, you get all the fluctuations. So it's, it's for the future. It's a building step, you know, towards the end. So this one will go to the far side. Unfortunately, the modern, with the latest technology, this is a NASA experiment, it doesn't have long duration batteries so it won't survive a single lunar night because it needs solar power and its batteries will die out so it's a first step but it's not going to get the results one experiment that is interesting it's going to go up also in 2026 is a chinese experiment so this is rather amazing they very cleverly realized if you want to get power your antennae and to get the signals back back to you why not put them on an orbit going around the moon? It takes a couple of hours, they come back into the sunlight, then you send your signals back to Earth. In this case, they have a mothership along with the eight small, small antennae, small satellites, and they'll be orbiting the moon in 2026. That's, in my opinion, the most likely experiment to succeed in the near future to get the first step to building this large interferometer on the far side of the moon. They'll go around the far side, look for the signal, come back, and then send it back to us, the idea. So that's a beautiful experiment, but we're not stopping there, of course. Let me now take you to the future. Okay, so this is what we foresee in the future, and it gets really exciting. 
So there are a number of, uh, of countries involved. So these are, are still really just designs really at this stage. Um, so um, here's um, uh, uh, the American design, which has 128 antennae on the far side, laid out by these lunar robots uh, with some central correlator in the sky, which be a satellite we send the signal to. Here is um, the European version. So what ESA is building is basically it's a transporter. This is a, think of this as a track on the earth full of packages with your scientific experiment wrapped up here. It can carry one and a half tons. It's been approved by the, the, the ministers of the uh, European Space Agency of, of, the, of the European countries actually. And, and we'll go to the moon at the end of this decade and it'll take the sort of equipment you need to build this. So this consists, uh, another design from Europe, consists of inflatable tubes on which you print dipole antennae, okay? And so inflatable tubes, you can, you know, they're light, you can carry many of them. And the idea will be to have a few thousand of them on the lunar surface, maybe by the mid 2030s. And then finally, the most imaginative thing of all, hard to believe this could ever happen, is this experiment, again, being designed, which will have 100,000 antennae over 20 kilometers, but the beauty of this experiment is that the engineers behind it are proposing to do the construction of the antennae on the moon. Because, you know, the lunar regolith, there's no shortage of um, all the elements you need to build, you know, to build, do steel and, and build your antennae. And in principle, you could have a manufacturing facility there on the moon, which will happen in presumably within 20 years. So it's a futuristic thing, but that's the sort of direction we're going in. Okay, um, and something finally, uh, the last concept I'll show you is to have uh, an enormously massive radio telescope in a crater. So this is a bit like um, a, a machine called FAST in China, as was our, our Arecibo like in the US, Puerto Rico. Uh, you fill a crater with, um, uh, with some sort of uh, wire mesh, which would be your, 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 your antenna, your reflector, with a receiver suspended from the crater rims. And so this in principle is, is a design for a huge dish, very high resolution. Again, the sort of machine that you would need in combination with the interferometers to sort out all the systematics, the foregrounds, et cetera, to do the job properly, to get down, get to the dark ages. So these are the things we'll be doing on, on a longish time scale, I must say, but it's definitely, you know, think 20 years. And this is what we're, one of the things we might be doing on the moon. I'll come to the practical details in a second, but, um, but just to tell you first, what is this signal that we're, we're looking for? So it's called, um, uh, it's due to the, at the end of inflation, uh, you're left with fluctuations in the major galaxies, but the beauty of inflation is it gives you a unique type of fluctuations. We call them, they are non-Gaussian, okay? And they're primordial. So you have to look in the fluctuations that you see in the sky, which in the cosmic micro background are beautifully Gaussian. When you measure those fluctuations, we see a Gaussian distribution, but hidden inside that Gaussianness, at the fraction of a percent level is the signal from the inflation. And that's what you're looking for. And so this was the prediction uh, made originally by Maldacena and others um, uh, of, um, uh, think of this as a, a Gaussian parameter, doesn't matter, it's 0.01 in, in some simple numbers. It's, it's the minimum value that's expected in, in fairly generic inflation models. It's a fraction of the, of the fluctuations, which I call in the temperature called delta D over T. Just to compare this with, uh, with other numbers, if the microwave, the microwave background is searched very carefully for the same number that's 0.01 in the, in, the, in the minimal theory, but might be larger, might not, but we're guaranteed 0.01. In the microwave background, our current limits are all the 10. With galaxy surveys, we'll push this better to one, but it's only by, by going to, to the dark ages in between the realm of the microwave background and the galaxy surveys that will find this elusive, elusive signal. And with the enormous number of modes that you have from the hydrogen clouds, you can hope to do ultimate precision cosmology. If you think of it, cosmology is sort of the one over root n of the number of modes or something. So we're limited at the moment to very good cosmology order, a percent or something with, with a microwave background. But in the future, we have to do much, much better to pick up this elusive signal. And that can only come, I think, with the dark ages when we can master that. Okay, so um, let me um, turn on to another experiment that I, I think is compelling and 
must be done in the future. It's very difficult to do. And that is um, uh, a second frontier. I've told you about the dark ages. So this next frontier I want to mention is the cosmic microwave background, which is a black body. It's almost the most perfect black body we've ever measured anywhere. And we see it in space from all over the sky. I'm sure you all know this theory, but the, 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 um, and the observations too, but the, the, the summary is that the COBE satellite measured this truly remarkable black body. And these have 400 sigma error bars, amazing to look at for an experimentalist, but it can't be a perfect black body. We know that things are going on in the early universe. Galaxies are slowly forming from fluctuations. Those fluctuations basically have to, you know, have some friction against the radiation. They must give you some heat. And there are more exotic things too that could give you early heat. And that's got to result in deviations from the black body spectrum. So we can prove the beginnings of structure formation, the very beginnings, way before now the dark ages even, by looking for these deviations from black body. So that's what we need to do to really verify the whole Big Bang model. There better be something in there that, that is more than just the seeds we see in fluctuations, but that's the origin of, of those of, of the structures we see today, which is this energy that was dissipated from the small structures that build up to bigger ones. So our basic theory today is, is like a, what we call the bottom-up theory. And um, I've tried to um, sketch it over here. So today, this is length scale of structure. And so here is everything we see with micro background and galaxies. As you go down to smaller scales, you should be able to see these building blocks, the small things that built up into the big things because of their friction against the radiation. And, and this is an effect you want to see. Okay, so this is what you want to look for, but it's, let me just try to explain how hard this is going to be. So the theory um, of deviations from this black body was um, predicted um, around 1969 or so um, by these gentlemen, uh, Sunyaev um, and Zeldovich. Um, Zeldovich now dead, Sunyaev still going strong. And they predicted that this energy um, injection very early from structure formation should give you some heat and it is too late to bake pure black body radiation. You can do that if the density is high enough, but you know, in the first months of the universe and later, you no longer make pure black body radiation. You made it before with sort of when you create photons by Compton, multiple Compton scattering, etc. But later on, you can't do that. You can serve photon number in most reactions. And so that means that you basically distort the radiation if you inject energy. So they, they, they figured out the typical distortions. And let's just look at, look, look at one of them. Um, it looks, um, uh, this, is, this is what happens in the first few months. It looks like this. There's a deficit of low frequency photons in the Rayleigh genes and an excess of the high frequency end. So the idea is to look for that at a very tiny level in um, the microwave background. Now, the um, experiment, the COBE experiment, to measure these tiny numbers, you know, this is a roughly the upper limits of one point 10 to the fourth. Um, and so we know there's nothing there. But to measure this effect, it turns out that we have to do a hundred times or a thousand times better than, um, than we ever did with the COBE experiment, which is very, very difficult. So, when an experiment's proposed to do this, do a hundred times better than COBE, they've been turned down because they were not sensitive enough to measure the ultimate experiment. To measure the ultimate effect. You've got to do so much better that it takes an exquisite experiment. And the only um, option is to either build, is to use a spectrometer, maybe a Fourier transform spectrometer put into space, but it's got to have a really, you know, heavy and large system behind it with a telescope, etc. And so to put this into space as a free flyer is one option, it's being considered, but the other option is to put it on the moon. And since we'll be looking for things to do on the moon, this seems like a natural thing to try to do. And in, in, in summary, what this is, is you go to um, a large crater on the moon, and in that crater, um, which is um, uh, typically near the South Pole, uh, and the craters near the South Pole are always, many of them are permanently dark because they have very high rims. The sun is never high or low below the horizon. So the crater in permanent shadow, they're very cold. Great place to start doing your Fourier transform spectroscopy when you want to get to three Kelvin or something. You're not quite there, you're at 30 Kelvin, that's been measured in the dark craters. But from there on down, it's, it's a fairly easy step. M much better than you know, working on the daylight side of the moon, where it's many hundreds of Kelvin. 
And so that's the idea. You, you, put, you basically put a, a tra a trans, um, a, an experiment like this in principle, you have some sort of cryogenic system, which has a calibrator for a black body and, and looks at the sky. And then you beat those beams together and, and you look in this uh, terahertz range, basically down to 100 gigahertz in this dark crater. And you just let it sit there at the bottom. The, the moon basically spins around the sky slowly. And so you can basically, you don't even need to, to focus the telescope, you just point at the sky. So in principle experiments like this can work, um, and, uh, uh, but they will be very expensive, but it's the sort of thing you could imagine doing on the moon. Okay, okay, so um, why have we done this yet on, in space? We have tried uh, an experiment that was already given to a thousand times better than COBE, was rejected by, um, by the funding agencies because it didn't have the sensitivity needed to do this experiment. That's the problem. You have to have something even better and more adventurous than what we call the Pixie experiment, the Fourier, Fourier transform spectrometer, with only a half a half meter mirror. That was the problem. You need something larger, okay? And that's going to be really hard to do uh, in space. Okay? But the moon is not is an option, um, and so um, why not do it on the moon? Okay, so. Um, and if you can do this on the moon, um, here is what you can hope to do. This just shows you the sensitivity curves. So basically, this is um, uh, the limit from the, uh, the fire ass experiment, the one age, the upper limits. These are various foregrounds and dust. You, we know how to subtract off the dust. That's not a problem. Um, these are ups and downs because you know, on one side, remember the peak, you have a, you have a de deficit, on the other side, the excess. It's just in quadrature. And so you can see the, um, the predictions of the experiment that was not funded, and you've got to do much, much better to, to beat um, the microwave background by 10,000 or something like that, right? To, to these basically factors is what you have to get, roughly 10,000, to get down to seeing this mysterious signal from the beginning. And there are plans, there are design plans to include this in experiments in the, around 2050 as free flyers, and a parallel concept to explore, we'll be doing the same thing on the moon. And so that's something that um, uh, we're trying to consider now. Okay, um, and so I, I should have said, sorry, let me just go back one, that what I meant to mention was this, that one of the amazing things you can do with this experiment would be you could measure the recombination lines. Now, the universe went from being highly ionized to being hydrogen neutral, which means that hydrogen and the helium recombined. When they recombine, they give you line emission. Now, this is the way we do astronomy all the time in our galaxy. You study recombination lines. You measure helium in the universe, in, in, in regions around our stars everywhere, really. Imagine doing this in the universe, measuring the universe's recombination directly from line production. Okay? So this becomes experimentally it really intriguing because suddenly you don't get a continuous spectrum, you get spectral lines at very well-defined frequencies, right? You know, you can look for passion alpha, Balmer alpha, whatever. And so you can do this in the cosmic background of the universe and the helium lines too. It'll take a slightly bigger experiment, but that's the sort of thing we'll be doing someday, that's for sure. Okay, so that, that's the, that, those are some of the prospects ahead of us. Okay, so let me try to put everything together for you. So right now, um, this is um, the distribution of power in the fluctuations in the universe. So the Planck satellite was wonderful. It gets you down to some uh, tiny uh, limit on, on fluctuations. This is roughly what we measured. But once you get below a certain scale, it just blows up. There's no power whatsoever. And these are current limits from the, from the early satellite that I mentioned, uh, Fire as Kobe, and limits on the Mac, on the, this early distortion of the spectrum and other limits from other experiments um, on, um, on possible structures in the universe. In the future, this is what we'll be doing though. Um, so where do we go to, if we can do these two experiments I mentioned, that is exploring the far side of the moon, we'll basically be getting the, the fluctuations, these clouds I talked about in this region of, of the scale. If we can then go on to do a more, this adventurous experiment in the spectral distortions, we'll be probing this region, the smaller structures. And so we'll then piece together this, this beautiful story now where we have our large scale structure on the, on, on the scales of galaxies and clusters going down to the, to the small clouds and the, and the small elements that built up from bottom up to top, uh, 
uh, in the bottom-up theory of structure formation. We'll fill in the whole picture and get a much better understanding of, of how we began. So that's the idea. Uh, we'll need two types of telescopes to do that, um, an interferometer on the far side and a spectral distortion telescope in a, in a dark crater somewhere. So that, that's the hope. Okay, so that's the future of cosmology, in my opinion, attacking things that we almost certainly cannot do anywhere else. And I'd like to take you finally um, uh, through um, uh, one or two other things uh, that we're going to do on the moon too, which in, are equally amazing, but more than cosmology. So just to summarize here, we're going to probe the dark ages by radio astronomy. So what's important is that this is really compelling science. It's guaranteed, with guaranteed returns. Um, so that's uh, why I find it very attractive. Here you see, for example, on the on the near side, um, the various um, you know Apollo landings, etc. On the far side, totally unexplored except for this one Ch Chang'e four uh, a failed experiment, and the North Pole. Uh, also, uh, but you notice many craters around the poles, and these are the craters which are going to be of great interest for exploration of the future for various reasons, which I'll summarize in a moment. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's not everything. Okay, so let me just um, tell you what else we're doing on the moon. This will not be long, but this in itself is, is, is quite a story. So think of the moon. The moon is seismologically very quiet. It doesn't have the equivalence of earthquakes. It has tiny moonquakes, but they're, you know, the Richter scale is unity or below on the moon. And you also can understand them. Um, and then there are occasional asteroid hits which may shake the moon. But the moon, basically, the entire moon, it's a big rock. And, it's, and that rock, when a gravity wave comes by it, can vibrate. Okay, so it's the earliest gravity wave detectors, which never worked, but were pioneered by Joe Weber, were bar detectors, right? So the moon, you can think of as a gigantic bar detector. So if our cosmonauts of the future, and we already began this in the Apollo era, actually, we measured the quiet seismology of the moon, okay, uh, 50 years ago. In the future, there are designs now to put a few seismometers, there don't need many, um, ideally in, in cold, very cold, dark environments, um, and they will measure the bar vibrations of the moon. Why is that so interesting? Well, the future of gravity wave astronomy is it, it's you know a major part of the future of, of astrophysics actually, um, as you I'm sure you all know. But it consists of um, the pulsar timing array at really low frequencies. These pulsars, you know, we're measuring them for years to find slight glitches, so frequencies of inverse 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 years. There's the laser experiment, a triangle of satellites in space, um, separated by a million kilometers. Okay, so that's a smaller scale, that's a, not quite as low frequency. And there's finally the experiments that are roughly four kilometer long in the ferrometer bombs, LIGO, Virgo, LIGO, India, very soon, well, in 10 years' time. So, but if you go to the moon, what you can do is in between, right? You can basically, because you now have an 8,000 kilometer bar, if you like, compared to your four kilometer or 40 kilometer in, in next generation terrestrial detectors, million kilometer, you know, in space, you can do in between, you get in between frequencies and measure the whole um, science, astrophysics that, of black holes merging together to get those as they approach together the intermediate frequencies. And there are designs to put seismometers on the moon and various other experiments oh, being studied actively now. And one of these collaborations already is hundreds of members uh, that's one of the center. Of the, so they're, they're seriously discussing this as a future experiment. It's not that hard to put seismometers on the moon. You have to make sure that they will calibrate it, there's some power, et cetera. But none of this is, um, is beyond the capability. It doesn't seem, in fact, terribly, you know, as high risk as some of the experiments. Okay, so that is, um, uh, and now the final thing I want to tell you about is building telescopes, just simple telescopes on the moon. This is something we can do that we can't do on the Earth that easily. The biggest telescope we'll ever build on the Earth is probably 39 meters, the one the um, European Southern Observatory is building, it's almost finished. Um, the reason we can't build, build large telescopes on the, on the Earth is that the gravity is, you know, makes it hard to support them. There are all sorts of atmospheric phenomena, winds, whatever. And so it's very hard to imagine a 100 meter telescope on the Earth. Um, why would you want to do that? Well, the larger the collecting area, 
the more the exoplanets, Earth twins, you can hope to find, and then look at those for possible signatures of, of biology or even life. Okay, so you can't do it from the Earth, and in fact, you can't even do the spectroscopy from the Earth that you like to do because of the atmosphere to search for traces of life, but you can from space. Now, the problem is from space, we're stuck with roughly a six meter telescope in space to search for exoplanets. And that's because the cost is just horrendous. And this happens to be the recommendation of the NASA decadal review uh, for the next 10 years. And it's very unlikely we'll ever go beyond that in space. And that is six meters because it already costs you know, several billions, most likely, of, of whatever dollars or euros or something. And, and so that limits us maybe to 25 nearby rocks, exoplanets. That's their, that's their goal, which will then study in great detail the atmospheres of, et cetera, et cetera, for indications of life. But 25 is nothing, right? If you, if you, if you, life is really rare, right? So we don't know how rare, we have no idea, but surely you'd like a bigger sample uh, to have any chance of success. And so the only way you can get that big sample is most likely with a much bigger telescope, and that must come from the moon. And you can build them on the moon, um, uh, and, um, and this will open up the possibility. Louvoir is one name for this uh, uh, US-sponsored idea of a satellite, and suddenly you can go up from, from um, uh, up to maybe get, getting yields of thousands, okay? And that would be exciting, but you can do more. And so here's an even more amazing thing that we'll do on the moon. Um, uh, and so this just show, shows again the, um, See, Louvoir is, is getting this number. This is the number of exoplanets to yield. And so with something 100 meters, you get this, and that would take you up to thousands, and that would be interesting. Okay, with a 100 meter telescope on the moon. Okay, but I wanna tell you one more thing. 100 meters is not the limit. So here is one of the most amazing concepts I've ever seen for a telescope on the moon. And that is you basically, and this is a mixture of quantum theory and optics. It's just amazing. So you basically go to a dark crater Okay, near, near, the, near, near one of the poles. And basically you, you put a, a certain number, not that many actually, you don't need that much collecting area, maybe a hundred five meter telescopes strung around the, the basin, okay, with the focal system strung over from the rims. And so, and the beams then focus, it's, it's a semi, it's like a spherical, semi-spherical telescope actually, hemispherical telescope. And we build, we know how to build those things. They're actually, the optics are fairly easy, but you direct the beams. And the point is you have to now get the beams, um, put, put the time again and get the beams in phase. And that's where the advantage comes of some interesting um, quantum effects now being applied to beam combining and phase delays and, and this sort of thing. I think we've done it now for two telescopes uh, already on the Earth um, to look at the center of our galaxy. We now have to figure out how to do, do this in a more general way and maybe at different wavelengths where it's harder um, for a larger number. But that will come. There's no atmosphere on, on the moon to, to mess you up. We've done it on the Earth successfully so far um, with two telescopes. Okay, so that, that, and what would you get out of this? Well, this is what you'd get. This is the TRAPPIST system. Uh, which is a planetary system 40 light years away, okay, with eight planets. And the planets are all thought to be more or less not that different from the planets in our solar system, actually, given, and the, you know, it's a solar like star, etc. So these will be prime targets to look at, and you could resolve them with nearly micro arc second resolution. And this means you could look for atmospheres or features or whatever, seasons. Um, you could you know, take spectra and get all sorts of interesting things. And so that will be an amazing target uh, for, uh, for planetary. So that, that's one of the hopes that you could do and find out if there really is evidence in nearby exoplanets that are basically potentially full of life, potentially, but we have no idea. You have to go and see for yourself. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So let me try to summarize things for you. So first of all, um, there's been an amazing renaissance in, in going to the moon in recent years. And the basic reason is this, it's that commercial companies have gotten involved, not always successfully, they've had their crashes too, but it's fairly low cost, relatively speaking now, even the United Arab Emirates had its flight a week ago, but failed unfortunately, to take a small uh, lander to the moon. Um, so, you know, anyone got now practically and, um, 
by an experiment to go to the moon and do something interesting. And what, and the, but the next thing that's going to happen is these are fairly small rockets with lowish payloads, you know, um, much less than a, than a kiloton, I imagine. But in the future, we now have the epoch of large uh, rockets, okay? And the, perhaps the most impressive one is Elon Musk, because um, un, unlike the um, uh, NASA's SLS, which is vastly expensive, it will send Orion around the moon and land astronauts on the moon in two years' time, but it's expensive because it crashes, it doesn't come back. But Musk's Starship um, will come back, and he estimates that it's, you know, it's gonna bring the cost of lunar uh, packages down Im immensely. So that's one reason I think things are gonna change rapidly. And already actually, um, the um, ESA is planning um, something called the Argonaut, a lunar lander, which would take one and a half tons of pay payload to the moon. And this is, is been approved and, um, and these can be up to you know, five meters across or something. And so this, is, this will happen around 2030, early 2030s. That's, that's the current time scale for that. Okay, um, so, um, and, and I mentioned that things are rapidly changing with the launch of these, uh, with the design of these new launches. So uh, we're up to more than 20 tons in terms of deliverable capacity. Okay, um, right, so let me then tell you where the telescopes will go. This is just a close up. Of, of some of the craters on the moon, which would be ideal for telescopes. Unfortunately, these craters are ideal for other things too. Many of them have got lots of ice in. Okay? They're dark, they have ice. And what, what, why is ice interesting? Well, ice is a prime mining uh, fuel for interplanetary travel. NASA has its eyes on the ice, other countries do. Um, India discovered the ice, in fact, uh, with the Chandrayaan uh, experiment from hydroxyl measurements. And so that ice will be used for rocket fuel. And that's, so, that's, so, you know, the astronomers won't be able to go and say, I want this crater. There'll be a competition for the craters, okay? And it's, there aren't that many of them. You can see the numbers are, you know, what are tens or something. Okay. And um, so again, this just reminds you of the, of the Indian experiment, the drill experiment, which measured the OH radical. And there are maps now of, of ice on the moon in these craters um, from all sorts of sophisticated devices. Let me not dwell on that, but move on. Um, to tell you this, that um, the number of sites on the moon where we could put a telescope or mine for ice or do other things is limited. In fact, um, you don't want to, you know, you don't want a crater with too steep a slope, that sort of thing. You have to get into it and this sort of thing. And so people estimate that uh, if you want to radio on the far side um, in a crater, then, you know, you're limited to craters which are smooth and mild slopes. Uh, um, and, uh, and likewise, if you want to do gravity work, wave work or far infrared, you have to go to very cold craters. And you, you better pick them with low water content. Otherwise, um, uh, there'll be commercial firms breathing down your necks, uh, demanding you know, access. Okay, um, so this leads us to the main problem behind all of this, which is right now, we have no regulation about the moon. Okay, so there was a treaty signed by many countries, I think, in, including India in 1967, the United Nations, in principle saying, we're not gonna pollute the moon, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem is there is no enforcement. Nothing was envisaged then. And right now it's time to discuss how we might do this. And I hope we'll do that. But the problems are, you can see, you have to decide what property laws are on the moon. You know, you can't just be, you know, country A says, I want that crater. And, you know, country B comes along and whatever, you know, you wanna avoid conflicts. Uh, there are rights to the minerals, you know, who has access to this, this supply. I haven't told you about the options for the rare elements. They're running out of them on the earth. The moon is a huge resource for rare elements. We know how to find them pretty much by using thorium gamma ray detectors. We create that, uh, that tracks uh, the rare element, the European one, whatever. Um, but that's being planned already. They, I think there are even Indian satellites doing mapping of the moon, planned to, to look for this sort of thing, geological mapping. And so we know, we know where to look, but how do you divide them up? Is the person takes the first image and they chart, you know, say that's mine or, or do you have to go there, put your flag on it. And then when someone else comes along with a bigger flag than you or whatever, and what, what do you do? So um, anyway, and then there's um, criminal law, you know, you have to worry about, suppose um, there is an accident on the moon involving, you know, military activity or something, um, who controls that? Um, it could be a free for all and there's pollution. So pollution, 
something you have to avoid. We try to be careful about that. You don't want to, for example, send your, 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 your rocket down to land inside a dark crater because you're going to pollute everything there. And um, so, you know, then you, but then you have to get into the crater on, on some suitable uh, lunar rover, which is not easy also, but we're designing those now. Um, and then the sky can be polluted too. How, how do you pollute the sky? You, you have lots of satellites going around the moon, relaying signals, giving you, you know, whatever, cell phones or whatever. That's a huge pollution too. The, the radio astronomers and so all, all of these things need to be discussed and arranged. We've made a complete mess of the earth at this point for all of these, many of these things. We have now about 10 years or so to try to do a little better job for the moon. Um, and finally, of course, you have to enforce these things, right? How, how do you, once you have a set of rules and agreements, uh, you know, who, do you have, you know, some police there on the moon? Who knows? I mean, all this is for, for a little while. We want to avoid this Wild West, you know, scenario for the moon, if we can. Okay, uh, final point, you know, all of what I've been telling you may sound like it's going to cost a fortune, right? Billions and billions and billions. Okay, so there's a moral to this really, and it's history. It's essentially the history of the Hubble Space Telescope. So why did we have these the Hubble Space Telescope with these wonderful images? Well, it was far too expensive. It was, you know, $5 billion or something now in today's dollars, and, but even a fortune at the time. We'd never have gotten permission to build it. Okay? Had it not been that there were other reasons that said, let's have the space shuttle, and that's the South International Space Station. So those were approved. That was a great step forward to uh, working in space. And for two or 3% of the budget that went into that, one could build all the satellites that we've launched okay, uh, into space. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's like an overhead, basically. The same, I think, is gonna be true for the moon. The cost of going to the moon, developing the infrastructure is really, really expensive, if I took 2% of that, I could build all these telescopes I'm talking about. You know, expensive, but you know, it's a tiny fraction of the total. So hopefully that's something also that we'll gradually realize, okay, um, as we decide to, uh, to move forward. Okay, so it's piggybacking that does the thing for you. And you can see the budgets. It's intriguing to look at the history. In the Apollo era, the space budget was something like, um, uh, I think, 5% of the gross domestic product. It was incredible. It's gone down since then um, after Apollo and it stayed, but it stayed roughly level. And there's more than enough funding at the, whatever it is, the 1% the or something of the, of the GDP in the US. And I imagine something not too different in India because I, I think it's pretty active in, in, the, in the space regime here. And, and we have enough funding to all of this stuff eventually to get our first astronauts to the moon, the first women on the moon in 2026 and then uh, lots more activity on the moon. Okay, um, Okay. so let me summarize. We have this wonderful space light environment. Uh, I've argued that um, it's gonna be the future of cosmology and the future of astronomy too, to answer these amazing questions. And now I think is the time to really be planning uh, our activities on the moon to avoid um, you know, having Earth-like chaos on the moon and doing things in a more orderly way. I hope that's gonna happen and um, uh, I encourage you to, um, to uh, read my book on the subject. And uh, let me end with you with this quotation, which I like, there are no limits but the sky. So thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks a lot for that uh, really wonderful and thought provoking. So we'll take questions. Thanks very much for that really stimulating talk. Uh, I had one comment, a question. Uh, the comment is that uh, just uh, 10 days ago, we had a meeting here on the lunar gravitational wave astronomy idea. Jens Harms, in mm -hmm. fact, gave a public yes. talk also. Uh, and uh, I think there were people from the Indian Space Agency who expressed also interest yes. in, yes. Uh, in uh, working with the Japanese, I think, in uh, taking that ahead, putting these seismic detectors. Uh, the, the, the question is very different, and pardon my ignorance, but um, uh, you, uh, the, the number 10 to the 12 uh, for the number of modes in, this, uh, in these dark ages, that was very important. Uh, where does that come from, uh, the, the, that number 10 to the 12? Yes, yeah, so the number comes from the following. Um, there are roughly speaking about 10 
billion Milky Way mass galaxies out there in the universe. We know that just from extrapolating for our present horizon back to whenever they first formed. Uh, okay, so the theory of galaxy formation enables you to figure out that the galaxies must have come from small clouds, which occasionally built together because it's a progression from small to big as the universe evolves. Clouds merge together under gravity and build up and eventually you get a cloud the size of the Milky Way, which then fragments into stars. That's both the history. So the question is how big are these first small clouds? Well, it turns out if the cloud is too small, if its gravity is not enough, it won't stay together. It won't, it won't, it can never get cool enough to cool down. So we can calculate that roughly a million solar masses is the magic number. And above that, the gravity works, the cooling works, the cloud can then cool down, make stars and join together other clouds and so on. So if you have a million solar masses and the Milky Way has got 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th solar masses, then that gives you a million. Do you have more questions? Hey, um, you mentioned about uh, the uh, deviations from the black body curve, right? Uh, the black body radiation the black body? curve of the yes. CMB. Uh, what would you learn from measuring those deviations actually? What would be the inference vis-a-vis uh, -vis cosmology? Okay, so the idea, as always, it's like archaeology, you're trying to see what we came from. And, and the theory says we must have come from small clouds. And the beauty of um, the microwave background is that it became a black body a month after the Big Bang. And so when it came a black body, nothing comes out of it. You know, it's all, you know, um, you know, basically uh, high entropy stuff, right? But when you can't make a black body, then you can see stuff that might have been injected. And, and, and in, in particular, what you can see is the effect of the small structures gradually building up into big ones under gravity. But in the early on, there's so much radiation, the gravity isn't terribly important. But what is important is the fact these structures can be removed by, just by friction against the radiation. And that friction gives you heat. So you get naturally the standard model of our universe predicts heat injection from the smallest things very, very early. And so you could test our model of cosmology back to a month after the Big Bang, um, and that would be a major step forward if, if we see this signal. It's a predicted signal, it's guaranteed to be there. We just need the right experiment to get to it. And the reason we haven't looked for it yet is the experiment simply has been you know, too ambitious, too expensive, but someday we'll get. Uh, so this is about this non-Gaussianity that you mentioned. So there's this F and L parameter, uh, but th there's a little bit more information, the non-Gaussianity, including in the shape of the three-point function. Uh, so uh, can you say something more about that? I mean, could we actually measure the shape and see various properties? Because there's a lot interesting that's in the shape, not just in the magnitude. Well, absolutely. I think the shape is what you want to go for. Uh, and um, that may also um, you know, depend very much on the sort of mode that that went into this non-Gaussianity. So you can even get shape variations as a function of frequency of, of, of wavelength, if you like. So um, yeah, so after you make a, a, any simple detection, you'll then want to look for, 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 um, for shape issues, actually. And, and so people have tried to work out various shape indicators, depending on whether you have equilateral triangle configurations or very elongated configurations. So I think the shapes are different in these cases. So that's the first step. And then, you know, as you basically can generate better maps, you'll learn more and more. So it's um, not obvious to me what the limit is actually, where you can get to, but it's very exciting. Do you have any more questions? So, so what are the rates of uh, like meteorite hits and so on? If you are going to build like a big telescope on the moon, sorry, I'm afraid that with uh, oh, the sorry. Muffling... so micrometeorite hits on the moon, uh... meteorites. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. So the the interesting thing there is the moon with no atmosphere has been bombarded by meteorites for um billion, you know, for, for four billion years, and that means all the debris is on the surface, and that is why the moon is such a promising place for doing mining. 
And so all the big mining companies are excited about going to the moon because there they will find, um, you know, uh, one has estimated, for example, that the supply of rare elements is, um, is, is millions of times larger than on the Earth. And so on the Earth, we're destined to run out of europium, I think, in a thousand years at the current rate of mining. Uh, but on the moon, we can keep going for a very long time. And um, there'll be enormous profits have made to it because we use these rare elements in just about everything that, you know, from computers onwards on the Earth. And so they're a critical part of society. And so um, yeah, that'll be one, one of the major activities on the moon, almost certainly. The only problem will be how to keep it limited to avoid polluting the moon, I imagine. Oh, to build, uh... sorry, were you worried about, yes, okay, so the answer there is, um, yeah, the impacts of uh, large asteroids are very, very rare, so they probably, you'll probably say, it's the very tiny ones that are a problem, um, it's hard to be precise about the rates, uh, for example, the James Webb telescope, a million miles from the Earth, did have an impact with a tiny uh, meteorite, um, no doubt similar things up on the moon, you have to build your equipment to withstand the uh, you know, tiny impacts, and also there'd be repair facilities, that sort of thing on the moon. So I imagine uh, one has to plan for these things. I don't think it'll be, you know, really, really serious. That, that, that's the impression we have at the moment. Yeah, so large surveys generate like so much of data. And if you have all these telescopes up on the moon, how would the logistics of data transferred would work from the moon to earth? Like right now, if we require all these fiber optic cables just to get data from all our telescopes on the earth itself. And so how would the logistics of data work? Because we can't do analysis on moon, I presume. Well, at the moment, so I guess there are two solutions. One is, you know, you can use, you know, various modulated laser beams to do, the data transfer too, that's a field that's developing. I imagine that will be done in the future um, to satellites orbiting, orb orbiting the moon and they will relay back to the earth. Um, or you will eventually develop your own uh, areas on the moon where you could do data analysis. In principle, given the fact that we want to do these mining activities and many other things on the moon, that will be just one more application of our lunar infrastructure in the future. But the easiest thing will be have a satellite, satellites going around the moon and they would be basically the data repositories and transfer systems. That's what that's been done already with the Chinese um, instrument on, on the far side. It was a Dutch satellite that transmitted the data back to the Earth. So maybe in the interest of uh, Professor Jeff Silk over tea, let's thank, thank you again. Thanks.